everybody, Professor I here. As promised, here is my week two video. So to first off, give you sort of a bit of an overview of what week two is going to be like, you have some readings. You have Ain't I a Woman by Sojourner Truth. And it's a very short reading, it's just a page long. Um, and it's, a, it's actually um, a speech that Sojourner Truth, a uh, freed African-American slave made at a women's rights convention in Akron, Ohio, way back in 1851. So you can read a little bit about her and then read the piece all on one page. Um, the other reading is What is Otherness by Dr. Zuleika Zavalos. And um, <clears throat> she's an expert in this field. As you know, our theme is exploring the idea of the other. Um, people who for whatever reason may seem different from ourselves. And so Dr. Zavalos explores this idea and points out some interesting facts about it. Again, it's a very short piece. The third reading is an excerpt from Azar Nafisi's Reading Lolita in Tehran. And um, it's a riveting piece. Um, actually, this, these excerpts are from a book by that same title, Reading Lolita in Tehran. And the premise behind the book is that during the Iranian Revolution, um, Azhar Nafisi was a professor um, and she could no longer teach because of the rules of the regime. And she was essentially shut in in her home and so she began to recruit some former students to come to her home once a week for weekly meetings in order to read literature that had been banned by the regime. And one of the things that had been banned is the famous novel Lolita. Um, but there were lots of other works that the regime had banned. And so uh, it really was dangerous for Nafisi to hold these meetings it was dangerous for the young ladies to come to her home. Um, and so you'll read a little bit about what life was like in Iran in those difficult days. Um, and then the other two readings, we have the paper one assignment sheet, which I'm gonna go over with you here in just a moment, and developing a thesis statement, which is really central to writing uh, our papers. And so I'm gonna go over that one with you as well. You have three topics in your week two discussion board this week. So the first one is the power of words. And it's an activity that I generally do with students in class and I generally make it a lot more interesting and creative than what we're able to do here. Um, sadly, I'm not able to do that um, through a discussion board, but my hope is that it will, uh, the activity will help you to see just how powerful words are, and that's really what English 1010 is about. Um, the power of our language to move and change the world and each other. And then uh, the second board is considering ethos, logos, and pathos in Sojourner Truth's Ain't I a Woman? And so uh, after you've read Ain't I a Woman, you're gonna consider how did Sojourner Truth, a freed slave who was illiterate, she could not read and she could not write, how in the world did she manage to create a speech that was so powerfully filled with logos, logic, pathos, emotion, and ethos, a sense of her own trustworthiness? And then the third topic in the board um, is comparing and contrasting truth with Nafisi. And so that will be a, a discussion board where, where you'll look at both those readings and you'll sort of think about how the stories might be similar, how they might be different, that sort of thing. So remember that your initial posting for all three of those topics in the board um, is due for each of those three um, this Wednesday night by 11.59 p.m. and then a response to a classmate for each of those three topics in the board will be due before this Sunday, the uh, 6th of September, <clears throat> excuse me, the only other thing you need to do this week is to complete a Grammar Bites comma and few sentences exercise. 
and the instructions for how to do that, how to get there, are up on your syllabus as well as on the weekly checklist. So every now and then we'll have an exercise that you'll need to complete and uh, comma errors, few sentence errors are some of the most common errors that we see in 1010. So now I wanna take just a moment to go through this paper one assignment sheet with you and you'll find it by going to content up at the top of our course page and then over on the left hand sidebar looking for major paper assignments and related materials and then you'll click on paper one and it's a summary and response essay assignment our very first major paper so that little sheet that I talked about and that you read last week in week one um, about how to organize a summary and response and what it is that was the precursor to this actual assignment sheet for paper one so for this first major paper in the class, you'll write a summary and a response. It's also sometimes called a summary and paraphrase essay about one of the following texts that we're looking at together in this very first unit. So you, you could choose what is otherness, the piece that we're reading this week, or the excerpt from reading Lolita, Lolita in Tehran that we're also reading for this week. You could choose um, one of those two. And you want to obviously use that sheet that you looked at last week, what is a summary and response and how should I organize it to assist you as you're um, writing and organizing this paper. So here are the important dates. The assignment sheet will also uh, always list for you um, the dates that are important and sort of how the assignment plays out. So week three, that's next week, we'll have an ideal workshop for paper one. And so essentially, I'll give you a list of questions in what I call an idea worksheet. And you'll answer those questions and that will sort of begin to allow you to begin brainstorming about paper one and get a sense of direction about how to proceed. You might change your mind along the way, but it gets the ball rolling, so to speak. And then on Monday, the 14th of September, that's the day that you need to upload a rough draft of paper one for peer review and that has to happen by 11:59 p.m. that's on Monday night the 14th so a lot of the major paper rough drafts and final drafts in fact I think all of them always come due on a Monday night and the assignment sheet here if you're following along with me tells you how to do that you go to assignments up at the top of the page um, and if you do not upload a rough draft before that deadline time on the 14th, then 10 points are deducted from your paper one grade. That's how important it is for you to do that. And I will give you feedback um, on your draft to help you earn a higher grade. So it's well worth it. And then on Monday the 21st, that's the date that the final draft of paper one is due. That's also on Monday night before 11.59 p.m. And the policy about major papers, the final drafts, is as follows. 10 points are deducted from your paper grade when it's the final draft for every calendar day that that paper is late. And that includes the day that it's due and weekends. And papers aren't accepted after five days. So you wanna make sure you get it in. Um, this is often the downfall of students in 1010 and 1020 is that they won't submit their major papers and so many points are taken off and, and there's so much that happens as a result that hurts your grade that you just can't ever catch back up so make sure you submit it so there's a section here in the assignment sheet about specifics and each one will always have that so this paper needs to be at least two pages long that is so not very long okay for a college level paper just two they have to be full they have to be full two pages in length double spaced in times new roman 12 point font very important points will be deducted if you use a different font or different size standard margins and so you do not need to conduct outside research for this first paper you will not need to use sources or to use MLA citation in this first paper. We will from this point on though with paper two thereafter um, and we'll be studying MLA before then. 
So your essay needs to conform to a formal academic structure. You need your introductory paragraph with a thesis statement at the very end of it, supporting paragraphs, and a formal conclusion. And remember, if you don't have two full pages, you're going to get points deducted, so that's very important. The objectives of this paper assignment are twofold. So first, to summarize the thesis, the main claim, the main message, and the supporting ideas of the chosen text you're writing about in your own words, and we call that paraphrasing. So either What is Otherness or the excerpts from reading Lolita in Tehran. You would summarize them, first of all, in your own words. And then the second objective is to offer your response, your critique or evaluation of that writing and that the author's ideas based on your own opinions. <clears throat> so it's one continuous paper but it has those two components, the summary and the response. So to create a successful paper, you need to consider the following questions. Ask yourself these questions as you're writing. So have you clearly stated the title of the essay or article that you're writing about and the author's full name in your very first sentence? You need to do that in sentence number one, right? Have you referred to the author by last name only after you've mentioned his or her full name in your introductory paragraph? Very important. This is a college rule. It's college protocol. Always, always, forever. Amen, right? So I don't call Azar Nafisi Azar. I don't call her Mrs. Nafisi. I call her Nafisi. I don't call Sojourner Truth Sojourner. Uh, or Mrs. Truth, or my buddy Sojourner, I call her Truth. That is the mark of a professional writer, and this is going to be applicable to all your college classes. If you're in a history class, you will not call George Washington George, or Georgie Boy, or my buddy George, right? It's going to be Washington. So remember that. Have, have you clearly stated your, the, or the thesis, the main claim and idea made by the author whose text that you're summarizing and responding to in that very first paragraph. So in the very first paragraph, first sentence, in fact, we need the title of the piece you're writing about in the author's name. And then at some point in that first paragraph, we need to know the main idea of that author. Have I highlighted the supporting points offered by the writer of the piece I'm summarizing in the body of my essay? So after the intro, um, and so um, you cannot highlight every single point that the writer made because that's going to be way longer than two pages. A summary is brief, right? So you're going to pick and choose several points, maybe three, maybe four, uh, probably no more than that, that the author made that are, in your view, the most important points. And those are the ones you're going to summarize. Have you offered responses then? to that author's thesis, the author's main idea, and the main supporting points. So you could do it in several ways. You could critique the strengths and weaknesses of the piece. Um, you could evaluate the logos, the logic or reasoning used within it. You could evaluate the emotion expressed in the writing, the pathos. You could evaluate the credibility, the trustworthiness of the author ethos. You could do it in that way. Um, you could evaluate just the writing in a broader, a more broad sense. Um, what sort of techniques is the, the writer using? Am I seeing metaphor or simile or any of those kinds of techniques? Um, how well is the author getting his or her point across? And you could also, uh, um, you know, think about just the um, general tone of the piece. Is the author sounding really formal, or is the author sounding less formal, more conversational, things of that nature. Um, and then make sure, and this, this is going to be a brand new rule for most of you, but it's very important in college writing, make sure to avoid first person. No I, no me, no myself, right? Always and forever, amen, always in all college writing, all formal college writing, no first person ever again. You can't do it ever again. And I know that seems difficult when you're thinking, but you want me to respond with my ideas. How do I not use I? Well, we're going to learn about that. 
Um, also, you're going to avoid second person, you and your. Always, unless these words are part of a quote that you're using. You avoid them like the plague, okay? Um, instead, rephrase to avoid the words or use one or ones rather than saying, I feel Azar Nafisi did an excellent job. Azar Nafisi did an excellent job. Get out of the eye. Or one may agree that Azar Nafisi did an excellent job. Be sure you're using transition words and phrases so that the reader can follow your thoughts more easily. And we're going to talk about that before the final draft of paper one comes due. So words like, however, moreover, conversely, first, second, next, finally, words like that that transition that help your reader follow your thought process. Uh, the next question is, have I used sentence variety in my essay? So you don't want a whole bunch of little, short, abrupt sentences back to back, and you don't want a whole bunch of big, long, drawn out sentences. You want to sort of mix that up so you have a variety of sentence structures that do not bore your reader. Um, because all good writing has a flow, a rhythm to it. Have I used language appropriate for a college level paper or does my language feel informal and conversational? So now you're a college writer. You can't be a high school writer anymore. You have to up your game, right? So we avoid first person I, we avoid second person you, we avoid words like stuff, we avoid vague words like thing. Think to yourself, what is this thing exactly? How, what is it that I'm trying to identify here? Don't sound like you're sitting around with your friends, right? You, you want to make your language sound more formal. And so if there's a word you're thinking of and you're trying to come up with a better, more formal sounding word, right click it and go down to synonyms and hit that. Synonyms, words that mean the same thing. Or do a Google search for synonyms for whatever the word is. And see if you can find a word that feels a little bit more polished and professional. Um, and and that's, that's a process that doesn't always just happen overnight, but you can do it. Have I organized this paper well? So maybe you organize it chron chronologically, uh, discussing each point that the author made um, in the order that he, he or she made it. And again, you can't cram all of them into a two-page paper, so you pick and choose. Um, and then you may wait to respond with your own views until after the summary part. So first you write the summary, then you write the response, one continual paper. The other way to do this is to, uh, is point by point method where you, you make the author's point and then you respond. Next paragraph you, you uh, relay the next point that the author made and then your response. So either of those ways would be acceptable. It's, it's just all dependent upon which one you feel is the most beneficial for you. Check your essay for typos and spelling, grammatical, mechanical errors. Do it because you'll get points deducted if you don't do it. And it's easy. Um, Ask someone else to read your essay and provide some feedback. So um, your sheet here says go to the tutoring center. Obviously, you can't do that because it's closed. But there are online tutors, and your syllabus gives you the inform information um, <clears throat> for how to go about that. They're wonderful. They're the people who would have been working with you in the tutoring center. Um, so, uh, you know, submit it online and get some feedback. Have you met that minimum two full page length requirement? Otherwise, you're going to get points deducted. And have you remembered again, this is one essay, just one, but it has the summary and the response, however you want to do that. And there's a separate sheet that you can look at in this same section um, that gives the TBR, our governing body, the Tennessee Board of Regents, student learning outcomes that are actually being evaluated in each of the major papers. So uh, if, you, if you had a mind to look at that, you certainly could. Let's take another look uh, or a look at another of our um, uh, sheets for this week, and that is developing a thesis statement. So to get to that sheet, you would go to contents 
and you would go to course documents in that left hand toolbar and then click on developing a thesis statement. So a thesis statement is a statement. It's not ever a question. It's a statement, a declarative statement that focuses your main idea into one or two sentences, the main point of your paper. Everything that you write <clears throat> should develop around a clear central thesis. So in fact, if you were to ask yourself, okay, what's the point of my paper again? Your answer should resemble your paper's thesis statement. So it's not just a statement of opinion about something, but it's a statement that makes an argument. And sometimes um, if we're arguing something controversial in a paper, like the idea of abortion, um, then, then that aspect of the writing becomes even more pronounced. In this case, we're not arguing about uh, a su summary and response <clears throat> to Nafisi or to Zavalos, but um, in a sense, this idea that it still makes an argument, and it raises a point that someone could disagree with, right, uh, is valid. And so it raises a point that's debatable. It answers the question, so what? So why does this matter? Why does this piece by Azar Nafisi matter? Why does this piece by Dr. Zavala's matter? Why should we care about it? So a thesis statement is going to tell your reader how you interpret the significance of the subject matter under discussion. It's not just going to say, here's the subject matter. It's going to tell your reader how you interpret the significance, the meaning of it, right? Um, it provides a roadmap for the rest of your paper. So it tells your reader what he or she can expect in this paper. It directly answers the question asked of you, if you have a prompt question, or directly responds to the description of the paper outlined in your assignment sheet. So that thesis needs to directly respond to the fact that this is a summary and response. So again, remember a thesis is an interpretation of a question or a subject. It's not the subject itself. So the subject or the topic of an essay might be World War II, or it might be Robinson Crusoe, the novel. But the thesis offers a way to understand World War II or to look at that novel, right? It makes a claim that others could dispute, and it's usually one sentence located right at the end of paragraph one. It's the last sentence of paragraph one it presents your idea or your argument to the reader, and then the rest of the paper, the body of that essay, gathers and organizes evidence to persuade the reader of the logic of your interpretation. So an effective thesis can be longer than one sentence. It might be two. And the thesis may not necessarily appear at the end of paragraph one. Um, some well-written papers, in fact, at more advanced levels contain what we call an implied thesis, where there's no one sentence that you could point to that articulates the main idea, but nevertheless, you get the main idea very clearly. But for our purposes in 1010, we want a clear designated thesis statement as the very last sentence of paragraph one. So how do, how do I get a thesis? Well, <clears throat> it's the result of a thinking process, and it's not the very first thing you're gonna do after you've read the paper one assignment sheet. First, you've got to collect your evidence and your ideas. You've got to look for relationships between facts. So maybe a contrast or maybe a similarity. You've got to think about the significance of the relationships. And once you do that thinking, you may have a working thesis. So a basic or main idea, an argument or an idea you think you can support, but you might need to adjust it along the way. And Writers use a lot of different techniques to stimulate their thinking, to help them clarify relationships or comprehend the broader meaning of a topic and arrive at a thesis. So you might want to brainstorm ideas, again, with a tutor in the online tutoring center, with one of your classmates or friends or family members. Um, and the idea worksheet helps you sort of begin that brainstorming process. Well, how do you know if your thesis is strong? So you're going to run it by me, obviously, on that uh, rough draft peer review day. Um, you can get help again from an online tutor. And um, even though if you don't get advice elsewhere, you should, but even if you don't, you can do some thesis evaluation of your own. 
So here's a way to do that. Ask yourself these questions when you're coming up with your thesis. Do I actually answer the question that was asked of me in the assignment sheet? Or I'm, am I actually responding to the statement provided in my assignment sheet that describes the parameters of this essay? So this is a summary and response, right? So if your thesis is not letting the reader know, I have written a summary and response paper and it's about to begin, folks, then you're, you're off the track. So rereading the question or the prompt on the assignment sheet can help you fix an argument that is missing the focus of the assignment. So here's a great technique, just FYI. When you're working with a prompt question, and this will happen to you a lot in your college career, turn the question into an answer by regurgitating it, that's a fancy word for vomit it back up, yuck, um, in statement form. So for example, here's a prompt and a question. Write an argument essay on the subject of immigrant refugees. Should the United States welcome them? Why or why not? Now you're going to regurgitate that question back in answer form in your thesis. And here, here's how it's done. After careful research, one may see, notice I didn't say you may see, one may see that the United States should or should not, based on your view, welcome immigrant refugees into our country because then state a reason, just very succinctly there. You want to make sure you've taken a position that others could challenge or, or oppose, because if your thesis is just stating a fact that no one can disagree with, then you're just providing a summary uh, in your thesis rather than an actual thesis. So I can't say, uh, one may argue that George Washington was the first president of the United States, because obviously, he was, right? That's a fact. So uh, I'm not taking a position that anyone could argue with there. Make sure your thesis is specific enough. So if it's too vague, it's not going to put forth a strong idea or argument. So if you've got vague words, non-specific words like thing, define the thing, good, bad, how is it good or bad? Is it unhealthy? Is it beneficial? Is it unsafe? Is it, you know, how is it good or bad? People, who are these people? Are they advocates? Are they opponents? Are they the elderly? Are they teens? Are they citizens? Who are they? Uh, beautiful, tell us how this thing, thing is beautiful, right? Um, what is the thing? Why and how is it good or bad? What makes it beautiful? To which people do you refer? Does your thesis pass the so what test? So if the reader reads it and the first response of the reader is so what? Why should this matter to me? Why should I care about uh, Zavalos or Zarnafisi? Then you might need to clarify, forge a relationship, connect up to a larger issue. Does my essay support my thesis without wondering? Here's the golden rule. Here it is, engrave it on your brain, big old gold letters. If your thesis and the body of your essay do not go together, one of them must change. Say it again. If your thesis and the body of your essay do not go together, one of them must change. And it's okay to change your working thesis to reflect ideas that you're figuring out along the way. It's okay to change the writing in the body of your paper. Good writing is all about revision. Does your thesis pass the how and why test? So if the reader reads the thesis and thinks, okay, but how or why? Then the thesis may be too open-ended. But if you're answering those questions a little bit later on in your paper, maybe not. So you have to consider the paper holistically as well. So here are some examples. Uh, let's say you're writing a persuasive essay where your goal is to persuade your reader on the topic of the other. And you receive this prompt on an assignment sheet. Take a position on whether or not an in-group, out-group mentality is healthy for society. Provide sources to support your argument and refute the opposition. So you've got a lot going on, you're feeling kind of lazy, you're in a big hurry, and so you do not take time to actually read and research. You just turn on your computer and start typing, and you type out this, this weak thesis. There are many reasons why an in-group, out-group mentality may be bad for society. Well, duh, right? We all know that. 
We all know that. You're stating a fact that no one can disagree with. Um, and bad is a vague word. So how, how is it bad? And the reader's going to think, well, so what? What reasons? Why should I agree with you? Why do I want to read your essay any further? So you want to ask yourself those same questions and start doing the hard work of actually comparing the ideas of experts concerning whether or not this idea of uh, you know, separating persons into groups is healthy for society. And as you begin to research, you're going to find out some facts like science proves that the human brain actually needs to categorize people and places and ideas and events in order to make sense of them. So it's sort of hardwired into our brains, right? Um, and recent research studies uh, that, that provide information on the way in which these in-group, out-group ways of looking at the world uh, benefits evolution might be something that you might um, use. And then, then you're going to consider the overall morality of the situation. Is it morally right ever to just think that I'm superior to someone else? just because that person's part of a different group? No, right? So when you start to do that hard work, you, you have to decide what you think by pushing your comparisons toward an interpretation. Why does this topic matter? What are its implications for us? Um, how does it affect us? Um, and so a thesis can't just state a fact that we know to be true. It has to make a claim <coughs> that others can disagree with. So. Now you decide that you're going to revise. And, and here is your revision. Though some feel that an us and them mentality is pre-programmed into the human brain, research into the topic reveals that this way of viewing the world leads to chaos, war, and unrest for our world. Now you've got a working thesis, right? And as you work more and research more and write more, uh, you might decide to add a second sentence to that working thesis and you come up with a final thesis that really captures the argument. Though some feel that an us and them mentality is pre-programmed into the human brain due to evolutionary development processes and is therefore essential to our ability to function, research into the topic reveals that this way of viewing the world leads to chaos, war, and unrest for humankind. Notice how this time we change uh, for our world to for humankind because we already just said something about our world in the same sentence and that repetition is weighing your language down, right? To truly evolve as humans in a world whose interactions are becoming more global, we must learn to view others, no matter how different they may seem, as equally deserving of rights, life, and liberty. So when you compare that back to that original weak thesis, that presents ways of interpreting the evidence that is illuminating the point, the significance, the bearing of that question, right? And that's, that's one of many interpretations of the topic. It's not necessarily the one and only right one. There usually isn't a one right answer in an English class. I hate to tell you this, math folks, but there are only strong and weak thesis statements and strong and weak uses of evidence, but there are a myriad of interpretations. So the last part of this little um, sheet here are tips for essay organization and writing. And, and so uh, it tells you again how to organize. It tells you some important ideas about the introduction. It's a good idea to begin with what we call a hook, right? So that, that refers to an opening line that makes your reader want to keep reading. And just like in a song lyric, the hook is the line that's usually repeated. And so effective hooks include questions that make readers think right off the bat, relevant quotes, brief anecdotes, but you want to avoid these trite phrases, these overused phrases in your hook, like throughout history, from the beginning of time. Remember, it's a two-page paper, folks. You can't talk about world history and, and, and the whole history of the world in, in two pages. Um, and your first paragraph must continue by introducing the subject, and finally presenting your thesis. So every time when you're writing a, a paper, no matter what kind of paper it is, ask yourself, what does the reader need to know right off the bat? So if you're analyzing a text, if you're responding to a text, you got to know, okay, what text is being analyzed and responded to here, um, or summarized in, in this case and responded to here? 
We need to know your opinion and we need to have your thesis statement. It's always a good strategy to start broad with a hook and then narrow, narrow, narrow to the thesis. So here's an example. Most of us have experienced situations that seem challenging, but not everyone has lived through the violence, war, destruction, and devastation of a totalitarian regime. There's the hook. So the reader's thinking, okay, I can identify with that. I've lived through some challenging things, but wow, violence, war, destruction, totalitarian regime, no. Um, this might be interesting. What is this gonna be about, right? So now the reader's kind of hooked. Moreover, there's a transition word. Few of those who have survived such tragedies are able to translate their grief into a vivid, poignant memoir that allows courage and truth to shine through its pages, pointing the reader toward a kind of bravery that uplifts us all. So that's a, a sentence that's transitioning from the hook, still broad, narrowing a little bit more into the thesis. And now here's the thesis. After a thorough read of an excerpt from Azar Nafisi's acclaimed book, Reading Lolita in Tehran, one may see that Nafisi creates an effective, moving account that transports readers into a different world, allowing them to step into the shoes of the other. So this writer really nailed it here. And then your body paragraphs, they're gonna establish the supporting points, the points that are validating that main claim that you're making in your thesis statement. And this reader's main claim is, Nafisi has created an account that's effective and it's moving. That's got some response in it with those adjectives, effective and moving, right? So notice how this writer is already responding, just, just interweaving some response into the thesis. Um, so we know what this paper is going to be about. We already get a sense of the writer's feeling about Nafisi and her work. Uh, so, we need evidence to support the ideas that this piece is vivid, it's realistic, it's effective, and it's moving in the body of our essay. So ask yourself, what sentences in Nafisi's story show the use of vivid details, right? What sections are using language that feels real? So conversations maybe between Nafisi and her students. What exactly is making this memoir effective? What portions are appealing to us emotionally? So we need to give examples of those sections so that the readers see the evidence for our claims to establish our own logos and ethos as writers, right? And the, the conclusion is a paragraph that sums up or restates your thesis in different wording. Hello, do not repeat your thesis word for word. It will bore your reader out of his or her mind. Do not do it, do not do it, right? Find something new to add to that thesis at the end. Um, so I give you a beginning template for a thesis for paper one. Use it if you want, if you're struggling. Through a close summary and response of blank, give the title. By blank, give the author's full name. One may see that the use of blank, blank, and blank allows the writer to create an effective text. Now you might only fill two of those blanks. You might fill three. Think about what is it that's making this text work? Is it vivid detail? Is it realistic dialogue? Is it pathos, emotion? Is it logos? Is it ethos? Is it the tone of the piece? What is it that's making it work? And again, don't confuse a topic with a thesis. Gun control is a topic, but if you're gonna turn that into a thesis, you've gotta ask yourself, so what, what about it? So here's a weak thesis. Gun control is a controversial topic in American society today. Duh, right? That's a fact, we all know it. It's not a debatable claim, right? Here's a strong thesis. After thoroughly researching the topic of gun control, one may argue that imposing rigid laws mandating citizens' rights concerning weapons contradict the foundational principles of the American Constitution. Boom, now you've made a debatable claim. With, with which others could agree or disagree, right? And you might make the opposite claim from that, depending on your stance on the issue. So I hope that helps you with, um, with you know, approaching writing a working thesis statement. Next week, just write quick like. Very first thing you wanna do is the ideal workshop for paper one. 
and you, you want to submit that before 11.59 p.m. on Tuesday the 8th. That's on your syllabus and in your weekly checklist. Then you've got a sample paper I want you to read, and I want you to read rhetorical terms and concepts, general MLA guidelines, and avoid to be verbs. Here's another new concept that I'm going to throw at you. Avoid to be verbs when, when at all possible, because it's going to weigh your language down. And then there's a wonderful documentary that I want you to watch. It's very short. It's an interview with Azar Nafisi. I want you to see her and hear her and see what she's like. Um, it's amazing. And then in our week three discussion board, there's only one topic and it's analyzing that sample summary and response paper. And by the way, um, there are sample papers up for you uh, that for, for all four of the papers, you know, where you can actually see um, what they're like. And uh, on paper four, for example, I've uploaded some sample student papers and, you know, some of the time they're just exemplary. There's one on paper four that, that isn't so hot. Um, but most of the ones I've uploaded are, are exemplary for you to give you an idea of what an A-level paper would look like. So. Thanks for watching. Thanks for your patience. Have a great week, and I will see you soon.